many times we pray right before a sermon, we pray what we call a pray, prayer of illumination, that God would illuminate His Word to us. And today we're going to sing that prayer. So learn it as we sing it, um, pray it if you don't feel like you can learn the melody along with us, but pray this prayer as we sing together. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, help us to receive, break the hard and stony ground, help our your word down deep in us, cause it to bear fruit, open up our ears to hear, lead us in your truth, show us Christ, show us Christ. Why? 
Standing face to face In a moment we will be like him He will wipe our eyes dry Take us up to his side And forever we will be his Singing blessing and honor And glory and power Forever to our God Singing blessing and honor And glory and power forever to our God. Singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God. Singing blessing and honor and glory and power forever to our God. Singing blessing and honor and glory. Judges chapter 20. We're going to wrap up the book of Judges as best we can. Judges chapter 20. We're going to tackle two chapters in this sermon. So here we go. All right. Judges chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 11 as we begin together. Then all the people of Israel came out. From Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mitzpah. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. Now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mitzpah, and the people of Israel said, Tell us, how did this evil happen? And the Levite the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me, surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. 
for they have committed abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, all of you, give your advice and counsel here. And all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go to his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do in Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people, that when they come they may repay Gibeah of Benjamin for all the outrage that they have committed in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, united as one man. Let's pray together. God, we ask right now that you would help us as your people to understand this text and what you mean uh, through this story for us. And Father, help us to comprehend what it means to be a man or a woman that seeks to live in submission to your kingship. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, and it's for his sake. Amen. Now, we want to remember where we are in the story, right? Israel is living without any real leadership. Uh, they do not have a king. And it's, it's almost like they're a glutton at a smorgasbord. They are living in a land with idols all around them, and they're just gathering all of the idols that they can to themselves. And they're worshiping those idols. They're sacrificing to those idols. They're obeying their idols, and they're believing in these idols, but in the beginning of Judges, we saw in our first message together that God allowed the threat, the people in the land, He allowed the people in the land to stay so that the people of Israel would learn war, so that they would know war. He wanted them to understand what was worth fighting for, and that is the promises and the inheritance that He had given to them. And so as we look through the story, we notice that God began to give them judges, judges that would come and would rescue them out of the hands of the Philistines or the Amorites or, uh, or the Canaanites. And, and, and he gave them judges. Some of the judges were good. Some of them were godly. But then we saw that some of those judges were not good and were not godly. And then the last story that we just looked at just in a few minutes ago, uh, we see a Levite traveling from Bethlehem. He enters into the territory of Benjamin, and the house where he is staying is surrounded by homosexual perverts. And so in order to save himself, what does he do? He shoves his own wife, his concubine, out the door into the hands of these men. And so what we see in chapter 20 is the consequence of those things. So let's try and walk through the two chapters here and kind of summarize them. Then we're going to go back and we're going to look at some principles that we can glean from them. I think that will help us understand what it means to live a life in submission to God's kingship. So we look and we see that Israel, all of Israel, assembles at Mitzpah. Now, the tribes gather from all over the land. It says that they came from Dan to Beersheba. What he's saying is they basically, for us, it would be like they came from California and Maryland. They came from every stretch of the country. Every single tribe came to represent there what was going on in Israel. And all of the tribes respond in horror as they collect the dismembered part of this concubine and they gather then at Mitzpah. So the chiefs of the tribes, they begin to meet together at Mitzpah, and they ask, what in the world has happened here? What has happened here? And so then we see the Levite steps up, and he begins to give his report. Now look down there in verse 4 again with me, down, down to verse 7. It says, the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night and the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, all of you, give your advice now on what we should do. So then we see the chieftains come together. 
And they begin to make a decision. They decide to unite to the, together to go to, uh, to, to this land, this land of Gibeah, to Benjamin, and to, 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 to talk to them, to, to send an envoy of people to come. And we want those men to, uh, to stand and, and, and take credit for the things that they've done and, and re- reap the consequences of what they've done. And so they send out their envoy to, to Gibeah. And we see that in verses 13 down to verse 17. Turn with me to verse 13. It says, Now therefore, give up the men. This is what they're saying. The worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. Then the the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Every one of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these men were men of war. Now, now I want you to notice something. 700 of these men that are coming out of Gibeah, 700 of these men, uh, they're experts with the sling, experts with the sling. Now, for Israel, this is like them bringing a knife to a gunfight. This is what's happening for them. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you've seen someone throw a stone like this, but experts tell us that it's estimated that a warrior could sling a stone that weighed about one pound. They could sling it about 90 miles an hour. That's like a, that's like a fastball in a, in a major leagues. So this, this one pound stone could go and crush, literally crush a man's skull. Now, I began to read that, and I was like, Wow, that just seems outrageous. I mean, that really seems fast. That seems really crazy. And so I went to YouTube because you can find all truth on YouTube. And sure enough, there's a video. There's always a video. There's this young lad. He's not a very good shot, so bless his heart. But man, can he throw this stone really fast. And he's throwing it against a watermelon and blows up the water. And he throws it at a coconut, which is about as hard as a man's skull, and cracks the thing in pieces. I mean, this is, this is something. This is crazy. But this is what the people of Israel are now. They're going up against these men. Benjamin refuses to give their men over to Israel. And so they set themselves against the rest of the tribes to go to war. So then we see the battles that take place in the following text. The men of Israel go up uh, before the Lord at Bethel. And uh, Judah is called out to go first. And so the army draws close to Gibeah. But the 700 warriors, the ones who can sling the stones. These guys, they have the high ground because Gibeah is set up on a hill. So they're just shooting these guys with stones all over the place and they win the day and Judah retreats. So then the following day, they go, that night they go before the Lord once again and they ask the Lord, should we do this? Should we go again? And he says, yes, go up against Benjamin again. That following day, they lose 18,000 men in battle. And so the Israelites are devastated. And so they go to Yahweh once again, and he tells them that this time they will defeat Benjamin. And so the next day, the Israelites, they they go to Gibeah once again, and then they begin to do this withdrawal from Gibeah. And as they withdraw, what they... What they haven't shown is that they have an ambush waiting for the Gibeonites, the, uh, the Benjamites. So as the Benjamites follow them, they're, they're ambushed by another section of Israeli warriors, and then they're routed off into the wilderness toward Ramon. And so the cities are left in a mess. And in verse 48 in chapter 20, notice what it says. It says, And the men of Israel turned back. This is after they've defeated the Benjamites. And the men of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, men, and beast, and all that they found, and all the towns they found, they set on fire. So the Israelites turn against Benjamin, and they just raise the cities. They destroy the cities, every single one of them. They burn them down. Every man, every beast is killed. The cities are set on fire. Now, what Israel is doing at this point is they have placed one of their own tribes under the ban to complete and utter desolation and destruction without the approval of Yahweh. And now, in the following section, they begin to regret this decision. Uh, the, The rest of the tribes of Israel, now they have to salvage the mess that's before them by stealing women from other places in order to make sure that Benjamin doesn't completely be destroyed. 
So as we look at this horrible story, this is, the, this is the end of the book of Judges. What do you think the author is getting at? He tells us this, this series of horrific events. What is he trying to explain to us? Well, what he's saying is, this is what happens when you live as if there is no king. This is what happens when you live as if there is no king. Throughout the book of Judges, he has reminded us that the people of Israel were doing whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. But the reason that they were doing this is because they were living as if they did not have a king. They had forsaken their king. They had forsaken Yahweh. Yahweh was their king, but they had refused to remain in covenant relationship with him. And as a result, they suffered over and over and over again. But Israel isn't the only one who's ever done this. Israel isn't the only one who tried to live life out of submission to God as their king. All of us, every single one of us here this morning, we have the same problem. We have the same struggle. It's the same core issue. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden because they refused to submit to God as king. They wanted to be their own king. They wanted to be their own queen. In the story of Israel, even we see Pharaoh. Pharaoh refuses to submit to Yahweh's kingship, and as a result, what happens to him? His entire empire is destroyed. It crumbles around him. Israel committed themselves to the kingship of Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. And now, after they've received the promises, after they've received the land, they reject their king and they live like they are the ones who get to call the shots. They begin to live as though they're the ones who get to make the right decisions. And they live in such a way that they do whatever's right in their own eyes. So let's look together at the story and let's see what, what happens when we try to live as though we have no king. The first thing that we'll notice is we begin to neglect the truth. We neglect the truth. The the Levite fails to tell the whole story, doesn't he? So whenever we start to feel like we can run the show, when we we can live this life however we want to, we're not in submission to God, we're not accountable to a king, well, the truth is the first thing that begins to go. Notice what he says there in chapter 20 and verse 4. The Levite, he says, He says, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by the night. They they meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I, I, I took hold of my concubine, and I cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed an abomination and outrage in Israel. Now, notice what he says, but also notice what he doesn't say. He says, they meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room are fans of The Walking Dead. It may be a slim. We'll see. I, myself, I've enjoyed the show for quite some time. It's a really gruesome, horrific show, so I wouldn't recommend it. But one one of the shows I remember... In the second season, there's these two guys. One of them's named Shane, one of them's named Otis, and, and they're going to a high school because they're trying to get medication to help one of the other people in the show. But as they're at the high school, they're invaded by zombies, right? And so they're leaving this high school trying to get away with the medication. And as they're going, Shane, who's one of the main characters, trips, falls down, hurts himself. And so he's beginning to walk slower. He can't go as fast as he needs to. And Otis begins to surpass him. And these zombies are just coming around. And you know they're about to just chomp down and start eating these folks, right? And so what what does Shane do? He turns around and he shoots Otis in the leg. And Otis falls down to the ground. And you're like, what are you doing? And then Shane steps up and he begins to hobble away at a quicker rate than Otis. Otis dies. Now, what happens when Shane gets back to the group? What does he say? Does he say, well, you know, he was uh, going a little faster than me, so I had to shoot him so that I could get away first. No, he doesn't say that. He says, well, Otis didn't make it. Uh, Well, that's true. A little bit. But it's not fully true, is it? This is exactly what the Levite does. He doesn't tell the whole story. They, they didn't simply try to snatch them both and just, uh, unfortunately, she got grabbed and he didn't get grabbed. That's not at all what happened. What happened? He says, you know what? They want me. I'm going to put you out there. And he, she, he throws her outside the door. 
So he lies to these people. He tells them half of the truth. Friends, when you begin to live as though God is not your king, the lines become blurry and the truth becomes flexible. And we lie for all kinds of reasons, don't we? We lie because we want to impress people. Now, I don't tell this kind of a lie anymore, but, you know, I used to say I could uh, bench press 200 pounds. I might be able to lift that thing once. I don't really know if that qualifies as lifting 200 pounds. But we, we lie about things like that because we want to impress people. Or, or maybe, you know, we want to be more experts at iPhones or, or, or iPads or particular kinds of software. Maybe we want to say, you know what, I, I do make a little bit more money than what you think I do. And we talk about our gross pay or, or we begin to think about all kinds of other things that we would lie about. We would tell half-truths about. We, we lie because we want to impress people. We say things like this, well... You know, I, uh, I had this funny thing that I said, and then we realized that, no, I didn't actually say it, but I thought about saying it, and so now I'm telling you as though I had actually said it because we want people to think we're funny. We lie because we want to impress people. We lie because we want to escape the consequences. Adelaide Stevenson, <laughs> she's correct when she says, lying is an abomination to the Lord and a very present help in times of trouble. Oftentimes, that's the way we live, don't we? We want to avoid the consequences. That's what we see here in the Levite. He doesn't want people to know that he actually sacrificed his own wife in order to save his own skin. We lie to escape consequences. We lie to keep the peace. How many times have you kept silent when there's that conversation that began to open up with a coworker, and you, uh, and you began to think, you know what, this, this could be a very good gospel conversation, and then it's like you just clammed up. We become silent and we lie with our own silence, acting as though we have no king. When we act as, with, as if we have no king, friends, we begin to, uh, to ne neglect the truth. When we act as if we have no king, we also will make rash decisions. This is what we find here with the people of Israel. Israel makes oaths and sets herself at war against Benjamin. Look there at verse 8 down to verse 11. And all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go to his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people, that when they come they may repay Gibeah of Benjamin for all the outrage that they have committed in Israel. So what are we seeing here? They rise up as a mob and they become angry about what Benjamin has done. And they refuse to really think through their actions. They say, no one's getting to go home. We're making a decision right now. I mean, that's kind of like if you were at a business meeting and you're making a significant choice on something and we're saying, no more discussion, lock the doors, nobody's going home until we decide. This is what we're doing, right? Not a rational choice, not a rational decision. And they leave their future in the hands of chance. By lot, they will go up. So they're going to cast lots to see who will go up. And at, at this point, they haven't even inquired of the Lord to ask him whether or not they should, to ask him whether or not what they should do in regards to Benjamin. And so they, 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 they make oaths, and they begin to set themselves toward invading Benjamin, and they don't ask whether they should go, but they just simply come to the Lord and say, who's going to go? This is true for many of us, too, isn't it? We, uh, we're ruled by our passions a lot of times. And we make foolish decisions as a result. So maybe you, you, you constantly give yourself to angry outbursts and, and you say things that you ought not say to your spouse. And then you live with the consequences. You begin to think about all the mean things that you've said and there's consequence to your actions. Or, or maybe you stay up late and, and you look at porn on the Internet. And as a result, you know that sin, but as a result, it shapes and it changes and it disfigures the way that you look at your wife and it disfigures the way that you look at, at, at ladies here at church. It's controlling you and the consequences, they, the result of it is sickening and wrong. And it's all because of rash decisions that you make. A lack of submission to God's plan and His reign in your life will create a wake of poor decisions that you will have to clean up after. This is what happens when we live as though we have no king. 
when we live as, as though we have no king, we also forfeit blessing. The men of Judah, what we find here in the story is that many of them die in battle. They go to the Lord, and the Lord tells them what? Go out and fight. Go out and fight. But he doesn't give them the victory. Look what it says there in verse 18. It says, The people of Israel rose and went to Bethel and inquired of God, Who shall go up for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord says, Judah shall go up first. But then what happens? They lose the battle. They lose the battle. Then they go to the Lord again, and it says in verse 23, The people of Israel went up and went, wept before the Lord until the evening. And they inquired of the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord says what? Go up again against them. Now the author is, is silent. It's almost like he's, he's standing there writing this, but not really commenting on what's actually taking place. What it seems like is the Lord, as He has done in many cases throughout Scripture, is using Israel to judge Israel. So Benjamin is a judgment upon the rest of the tribes because they have abandoned the covenant just as much as Benjamin has. And the Israel, it's being waiting and waiting, and then they will judge Benjamin for the horrific things that they have done. It isn't until the last time that Yahweh actually says to them, Tomorrow I will give the Benjamites into your hand. So because Israel was making all of the decisions and just giving God what you might say just a little bit of publicity about the decision-making process, he does not bless what they're doing in this war. Now, you probably have done something similar. We've all probably done something similar. We, we like to, uh, a lot of times we like to say that we want God to help us make our decisions, right? Um, at least we say that at church. We want God to be a part of our decision-making process, and so we go through the process of making our decision, and then we kind of tag on the end a little prayer like, Lord, help me to, uh, to make sure this is the right decision, and thank you. But that's about all we give to him. And this kind of cursory prayer at the very end of our decision-making. We've already made our decision about what we're going to do. We haven't sought out the Scriptures. We haven't sought godly counsel. We haven't really prayed over this decision, but we want God to bless the things that we decide upon. This is exactly what we find the people of Israel doing. When you live as if you have no king, you're going to make rash decisions and you're going to forfeit blessing. When you live as if you have no king, you're going to try and make up your own rules too. This is what we see with the people of Israel. The elders, they swear to never give their daughters to Benjamin. And so they make this oath and they do this at Mitzpah. But the Lord never asked them to make this oath. The Lord never asked them to make an oath that they would not give their daughters to Benjamin. So, so we get to this point in the story and they're faced with a difficult decision. Benjamin is either going to die out completely because they have no wives. Or I guess we'll have to steal women for them. Right? What a horrible decision. So they, they, they decide to, 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 to steal human beings instead of repenting from a foolish oath they shouldn't have taken in the first place. And so they concoct this plan to kidnap teenage girls. And, and I can't help but think when I look at this part of the story, think of the, the judge that was there earlier in the story, Jephthah. Uh, in this story, Jephthah is one of the judges. And, and he, he's trying to barter with God because he's wanting victory in a battle that he's fighting. And so he says this to God. God, if you will destroy the Ammonites... For me, then whatever comes out of my house when I get home, I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe Jephthah had a lot of goats and oxen running out of his house. What typically comes out of your door? Is it a goat? No. So when he gets home, what happens? His daughter, his only daughter, comes running outside to meet her father, and he tears his robes because he's like, oh no, now I have to kill my own daughter. Now, Let's be honest. If you took an oath because you were a moron like Jephthah, you took an oath to kill whatever came outside your door and then it just happened to be your only child, would you do it? Or would you take the result of the curse on yourself? If it was me and I made a foolish oath like that and it happened to be one of my children, I would say, Lord, I'm repenting of this oath and you can do what you want with me. You can kill me, you can, you can take all of my blessings away, but I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to do this foolish thing in killing my own child. 
But here, this is what Jephthah ends up doing. And we find the people of Israel in the same place. They refuse to abandon this foolish vow, and instead they make up their own rules, and they begin trafficking human girls. When we begin to live as though we are people without a king, we also attack the godly. The Benjamites, they plan to steal wives from the city of Shiloh where the ark was. Look there in verse 16 with me. In chapter 21, 21 verse 16, it says, Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for wives for those who are left, since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? And they said, Well, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel, yet we cannot give them wives for our daughters. For the people of Israel had sworn, Cursed be he who gives a wife to Benjamin. So they said, Behold, there is a yearly feast of Yahweh at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel on the east of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. And they commanded the people of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in ambush in the vineyards and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyard and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. And when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, we will say to them, Grant them graciously to us, because we did not take for each man of them his wife in battle. Neither did you give them to, to them, else you would now be guilty. And the people of Benjamin did so and took their wives according to their number from the dancers whom they carried off. So, in their ignorance... The elders decide to further their sin by only, by only requiring young virgins for an uncommitted city that we saw in Jabesh Gilead earlier in the passage. But now they have 200 unmarried men that they need to get wise from, and so they go and now they try to steal them from Shiloh. What happens when we forget that God is king over our lives? Well, we begin to lie. We make up our own rules. We begin hurting people who are trying to follow God. In Shiloh, Shiloh was, was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was resting. The people of Shiloh were like the last vestige of, uh, of covenantal faithfulness. When we live as though we have no king, we attack the faithful. We mock those who are seriously trying to put to death the sin in their lives. We, we critique those who are, who are uh, trying to live out godly lives. When they mess up, we critique them harshly. And we love, we, we like to hear when, when the mighty have fallen. Why? When we're living as if we have no king, we like to hear those kind of things because it makes us feel better about our own sin. Well, I guess I'm not that bad. If that happened to that guy, if that happened to that girl. The elders of Israel were blinded by their own selfish sin and they didn't care about the innocent around them. The final trait that we see of those who live as if they have no king is that we pretend that everything is as it should be. Everything is as it should be. Israel returns to their inheritance. Look there at verse 23. It says, And the people of Benjamin did so and took their wives according to their number from the dancers whom they carried off. And they went and returned to their inheritance, and they rebuilt the towns and lived in, them, lived in them. And the people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance." So they left the scene of their crimes as though nothing had ever really happened. And why does this happen? Well, verse 25 tells us. Because in those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So my friends, as we conclude our weekend together through the book of Judges, how are you going to live? How are you going to live? Will you live your life trying to do your best, doing what seems right to you, trying to set the bar, the standard for your life, for your godliness? Will it be your opinion that controls the way that you live your life? Or will you be people who seek after the kingdom of God? You see, friends, when we're left to ourselves, worry will consume us. When we're left to ourselves, we will become anxious about everything in our life because we are tempting to control and, and do everything that we think is right in our own eyes. We will try to sit on the throne of our hearts just like Adam and Eve sought to do, just like the Levite attempted to do, just like the elders of Israel wanted to do, just like the men of Gibeah attempted to do. They did what was right in their own eyes. 
But Jesus tells us that there is another way. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. What is he saying? He's saying, seek after the kingdom. Seek after the kingdom. Yearn for the kingdom of God. Submit yourself to the kingship of God in your life. Submit yourself to the reign of God. Submit your decisions to the reign of God, your attitudes to the reign of God, your actions, all of your life. Submit it to the kingship of Jesus Christ. Seek after him with all that you are. Because the truth is, in the end, our eyes will betray us, but God never will. Let's pray. this world who claims to follow Christ you wear his name while chasing sin thinking his grace sufficed you have no fear of God you trample on his son you live for what won't satisfy your soul has not been one look to Christ look to the cross forgive your sin to great a cost when Satan whispers in your ear a hope of grace is lost look to Christ look to the cross or hear the sweet refrain echo for us all look to Christ look to the cross we hold the Lamb of God on broken flesh his thirst on righteous blood now we hunger for that lamb seeking our greatest treasure we abide within his word gaining our greatest pleasure dear dying lamb thy precious blood shall
okay, one thing that I, I just kind of thought of, Cameron, when you are leading worship so often, it seems like we are singing the words of Scripture, or at least the very ideas of Scripture. Um, and a lot of us, our cars are our sanctuary, and uh, where we can sing without being offensive to everyone else around us. And so, um, or at least that's the case for me. Um, are there some artists that you would recommend us CDs or for the younger people that don't know what that is, downloads um, for um, our vehicles so that we can worship rightly? Um, sure. I mean, there's many great artists out there, and there's a great chance that you know many that I don't know. So you can always give me recommendations as well. Uh, some that I have found especially for singing and congregational worship in keys that are friendly so you're not... Uh, trying to sing with Chris Tomlin, you know, in the stratosphere, or uh, you know, that's something you can really sing along with and, and enjoy the rich text of uh, would be Keith and Kristen Getty. I know you sing some of their songs in Christ Alone. We've sung many of their songs uh, this weekend. I would re highly recommend them to you. Um, I love just about all their songs. There's very few that I have, haven't heard and been like, man, that's better than the last one that I heard. It's so good. Um, so great stuff there, and also... Um, Sovereign Grace Ministries, they have a lot of great resources, and if you lead worship anywhere or sing songs anywhere, all of their lead sheets are free online, and they uh, write really solid stuff, but record well also, so great to listen to and sing with in the car. Those would be the top two that I would recommend. Great, thank you. Um, Luke, I'm going to give this one to you, because you spoke a lot this weekend about spiritual warfare, but you also gave a book away called The Spiritual Disciplines, so... Um, if we are at spiritual war, why does the modern church spend so much time begging people to engage in the spiritual disciplines and coddling them as opposed to confronting the passivity and enlisting, the, and enlisting them into service? Well, I would say that the, uh, the, that is true in some regards in, in a lot of churches as far as the passivity about spiritual warfare. Um, but I would say that the way that you enlist in the spiritual war is through the spiritual disciplines. Um, the, the, the method of our fighting uh, is not emotional, uh, it's not um, based on our opinions, but it's based upon the words of our God. And so when we, when we equip ourselves to fight in the war, we must begin with the word of God. And that's what Don Whitney in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, really begins with Bible intake. You have to take the Bible into your heart so that you do not sin against God and so that you have the tools then to fight against the evil one. So spiritual disciplines are absolutely key uh, to, to fighting spiritual warfare and to fighting against the flesh, uh, to refraining from the evils of the world, and for uh, fighting against the satanic powers. Okay. Um, Luke, if you could quickly answer the first part of this, and then um, Phil, you can take the second part of the question. Um, you mentioned spiritual warfare on Friday. Does demon possession still happen today? What does that look like? That's the, the one for Luke. And then um, Phil, or if you want to follow up, Pastor Phil, by answering, can a Christian be possessed by a demon? That's difficult to answer that one quickly. But um, yes, um, this kind of thing happens uh, around the globe today. And uh, it looks different in every circumstance. Like I said, uh, demons don't operate under the same modus operandi in Africa, in a, in a rural animistic culture, as they would maybe in Connecticut in, in, with professors of you know, science or something like that. So there's a different way that they operate. And, um, and most of the ways in which they operate here in the United States is more cloak and dagger. It's very subtle. Uh, and there is inner wooings and influences that... They use the culture that they've created to, uh, to provide distraction for us so that we do not follow after God. Uh, so it looks different um, in every circumstance. It's never always the same. As far as whether they can possess a demon, um, I mean, a demon possess a person, um, I think that um, how I would say it is, when the Holy Spirit is in your life. He owns you. He controls you. I uh, should, but I think demons can uh, affect you very strongly, and if there is unconfessed sin in your life or uh, you're giving yourself over to the influence of the evil one, 
uh, they can have a very strong influence on you. And they are deceivers just like the father of lies is. And they will deceive you uh, into thinking um, that you are maybe being influenced by the Holy Spirit when you're in fact being influenced by a demon. And that's why First John says to test the spirits and to know uh, that these spirits come from the Lord. Uh, because these these demons are not going to come up and say, uh, hey, I'm Beelzebul. How are you doing today? I mean, they're going to come up and say, you know, they might say I'm the Holy Spirit. They might say I'm Jesus. They might, you know. So you have got to be aware that the, 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 the enemy will affect and influence your life um, through a lack of spiritual disciplines, through a lack of understanding of the word. You know, just as Luke preached the other night, through confusion, which leads to presumption, which uh, leads us to, to all kinds of problems. So um, I, I don't think that a demon can control you the way that he can control a lost individual because of the power of the Spirit that indwells you. Because uh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But I do believe they can have a strong influence on you if you're not careful and you allow that to happen through unconfessed sin, through uh, evil influence. Yeah. Um, for a long time, there's been a paradigm uh, where it's kind of a dichotomy. You have, uh, you have demonic oppression and you have demonic possession. Uh, and the book that I recommended to you, uh, Spiritual Warfare by Dr. Carl Payne, is very helpful because he begins to unpack uh, the realities of what we see in the world today when it comes to demonic influence. And he talks a lot about demonization. Uh, he still believes that oppression and possession in some regards happens, but more of what we see is demonization in the world. And um, and the way that he, he kind of illustrates what, what Phil was, was saying is that um, demons don't possess anything. They don't have any ownership rights over anything, uh, especially in regards to a, a Christian. And so what happens a lot of times is, is when you begin to live a life of unconfessed, unrepentant sin, uh, that, that sin that's in your life, it's kind of like throwing a, a, you know, a big gallon-sized bucket of chum in the water for sharks. Right? So they smell that, and they, they, they look after that, and they, they seek you out. And so that, that's kind of a foothold that they then get to be able to involve themselves in your life. And the illustration that Dr. Payne uses in his book is really helpful. Uh, he says that the, the, it's kind of like we live in a house that's owned by a landowner, uh, but then as we make foolish decisions, we begin to sublet out rooms within that house to other visitors. And, uh, and that's the kind of relationship that a believer might have with a demonic influence. Uh, so we're, we're owned by the Holy Spirit, but then we begin to sublet out portions of our life because of unconfessed, unrepentant sin to these demonic beings, and they begin to have limited amounts of control in our life. And so that's why repentance and faith in the gospel is so absolute, absolutely key to fighting spiritual warfare. Uh, Pastor Sam, I got another question here on my phone that I'd like to ask you. You might need to do a little contextualizing of the, of the text in case the person, I don't know who it is, in case they're mistakenly thinking that this relates. It kind of changes gears, though. Um, the question is, how do we test the spirits? The Bible tells us to test the spirits. Um, what does that mean, and how do we do that? That's a good question. And according to 1 John, uh, we are to test the spirits and to see whether they... Confess Christ as Lord is the, is the thing that is given there in that. I can tell you that I've only had to do this um, one time in my life, and it was kind of a scary uh, situation. I was, a, I was younger, and we, we had went to this conference. Uh, it was supposed to be a Christian conference. We didn't really know what we were getting into. Uh, we went with a college professor, and they took us to this place. And uh, it was a Pentecostal um, Situation: People were literally running around the sanctuary praying, and we couldn't understand a, a single thing that was said. And they wanted all of us to pray in tongues and, and to be Christian or super Christian, as they would say. Uh, and so they took us to a room, those of us that were not initiated, and put us on our knees and had us repeat a phrase um, over and over and over and over and over until you started to speak babble and, and nonsense and... Um, and we did not, me and another friend um, that were there, we did not feel comfortable about what was going on. We felt uh, oppressed, if you will. And uh, throughout the day and, and in the evening, we got together and we opened First John up and we said, we don't know what happened today. We don't know if it's from the Lord or if it's not from the Lord. Um, and we got on our knees and, and to the best of our ability, 
looking at 1 John, we said, Lord, if this is from you, clarify for us. Help us to see that it is from you and, and help us to feel comfortable with it. And if it is not from you, uh, then remove it from us. And if, if, we allow, if we opened our hearts up, opened our lives up to an evil influence, a, a spirit that is not from you, rid us, remove it from And we prayed that. And um, what I can tell you is that we felt peace um, after that. Re uh, we, we had not felt peace all day. And we felt peace after that. And um, I don't know if that would pass a seminary classroom test or not, but that's all we knew how to do was to open First John and, and to put it before Christ and uh, trust that he would take care of us. Anybody? Um, how do you know uh, if you're saved um, or just, and just backsliding or if you're not a Christian at all um, because you just keep sinning? And um, let me start by just answering it a little bit myself and then moving it on to whoever wants to, to chime in. First of all, um, if you're struggling with your salvation, um, you need to spend a great deal of time in the book of First John. That's why it was written. Um, but I think one of the, the things that we do in, in the church today is make salvation very ceremonial, a thing that we can go back to. Um, and you won't find that in Scripture Scripture talks about a, po a posture before God, a posture of repentance and belief before God. Um, so an easy example is every single one of you are sitting in your chairs right now. Um, and the reason that you know you're sitting in your chairs is not because you remember a time and a place where you decided to transfer your weight from the floor onto that chair. That time does exist, right? I'm not saying that there's not a time of justification. The Bible speaks very clearly of that, wa terms like washed away or born again. Um, but the reason that you know you're sitting down is because your current posture is one of sitting down. Um, and so when, you, when you're examining your heart, are you believing the word of God or are you believing the words of the serpent or the world? Are you repenting of your sin or are you... Uh, reveling in your sin and enjoying it. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, I would rather be with my sin than I would want to be here right now. Well, um, that is a revelation of your heart's posture. So, any additions to that? Yeah, I think um, 1 John is, is the excellent place to go. In um, 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 7, he says, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is righteous, the one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now you may think, well, good night, I, I've sinned. I'm not born of God then, because to be born of God means I'm never going to sin. That's not what he's saying. The, the Greek there is a present tense verbs. And so it's more, uh, it reads more like the one who uh, continually practices sin, or the one who cannot go on sinning uh, is the one who is not born of God. And I think what, what John is trying to emphasize is that faith is always followed by obedience. Unbelief is always followed by disobedience. Now, there are going to be moments in life where we sin against the Lord. We're going to sin until the day we die and we go to be with the Lord uh, because we're not yet fully glorified. But there is in us, as Christian was saying, this posture of our life that we believe the words of God and we strive to obey the words of God. Our desire is to obey the words of God. Now, if, if we are wanting some assurance while at the same time getting frustrated that that assurance only, we, we only see that assurance as it is fleshed out in a life that's changed, therein lies a problem. You, our desire should be to love and obey God. That should be what we want. You see, when Christ regenerates the heart, he changes what you want. He changes your desires so that you want to obey God. And if you look at your heart and, and, you, and you don't want to obey God, and that's evident because you don't ever obey God, I mean, your life is, is habitually practicing sin, it's evident, according to this text, that you're of the devil, that you are listening to the voice of the serpent, just like Adam and Eve did. And you don't believe God, you believe the voice of the serpent. And so you habitually believe him and obey him rather than habitually believe and obey God. So it's not to say that you never will sin, but we will. But what is the posture of life? What is the 
uh, the normal practice of your life? Do you love God? Do you want to obey God? Or is it that you just want the perks of heaven without really having to worry about all that obedience stuff now? Um, Sam, I'll give you this one again because you uh, answered it the other day. Um, what is the difference between being tempted and actually engaging in sin's practices? We, we did talk about that the other day. I, I, and I go to the picture of David and Bathsheba because I think it tells the story. When David was up on the roof and he walked over to the edge and he looked down, he's just surveying. He doesn't know Bathsheba's down there. He looks down and, and she's naked, taking a bath, and he initially sees her. He's tempted to stay and to, to lust after her. Um, that is the temptation. Now, he doesn't have, nobody was forcing him. He doesn't have to stay there. He could have, when he looked over and said, oh, and, and turned around and, and walked away. That's not what he does. We know the rest of the story that he does indeed give in to temptation and he stays and he leers over and he sends his servant to get her and bring her to him. And, and, and the, one sin leads to another sin, leads to another sin, leads to the death of Uriah. Um, the point when we were talking about it the other day is we need to distinguish between temptation and sin because I think many times um, some of us beat ourselves up and we live a, uh, we go through the day and we live a life of guilt before the Lord because we have been tempted. But if we have honest conversations, you have never given in to the temptation. Therefore, you have not sinned. Being tempted is not equal to sinning. Now, when we're tempted, we, we need to take great care and we need to flee from the situation, not what David did. We need to flee. We need to go get accountability partners and, and let them know that I was struggling in this area, um, that I was tempted in this area. But just because you were tempted does not mean that you sinned. You know, you know the difference, um, whether you gave in or not. But I think many times we, we live guilt and guilt-ridden and downtrodden lives because we think that we, we equate the two and we, we think we have sinned. We have fallen short. We have not um, been faithful to God. Uh, and it's simply not true. There's a difference between temptation and sin. Okay, well, we only have time for one more, although there's more on here than this, and I'll... Uh, make sure you get a text response, but uh, I'll end with this one, Luke. You, you, you spent a lot of time talking about spiritual warfare as it relates to the family. Um, so whether it's our spouse relationship or our parenting um, relationships, talk just kind of a, in an overview um, our role in our families as it pertains to the gospel and why families even exist in the first place, why God invented that um, structure. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like this. You, you've been in a, a confrontation with your spouse before, right? And as you looked at each other in the eye, it was just this overwhelming sense of frustration because, I don't know, for me, a lot of times, if we're having a discussion, I find myself, I don't know if you guys are with me, I have no idea what's going on, right? And I find myself, and I said this one time to, to Kim um, you are not the enemy or something like that or something to the effect. It didn't work how I was intending for it to work. But <laughs> regardless, what I want, what I want to say is, is when, you're, when you're in this family life, the devil desires that you fail always. He wants you to fail. And so when you are thinking about your relationship with your spouse, when you're thinking about your relationship with your children, uh, think about it in terms of spiritual warfare. The, the reason that, the, uh, that Solomon says that our children are like arrows in a sheath um, that we send out into the world is because we are, we are raising warriors in your house. That's what you're doing. You're planning for them to go to war. So if you don't, if you don't think about that and be intentional about the way that you parent and discipline and train, uh, then when they go to college, when they go to Mizzou uh, or someplace like that, uh, they'll get eaten alive by the world and the devil. And so you want them to be ready to fight against the, the flesh. You want them to be ready to fight against the world. You want them to be ready to fight against the satanic powers. And so um, spiritual warfare is not, is not something that is abstract away from real life. Um, we live in a world, as Lewis said, that is enemy-occupied territory. Our job is to jump on the train with Jesus to sabotage the works of the devil. And so um, use your time with your family. Uh, use your marriage uh, as, a, as a catalyst uh, for 
we're tearing down strongholds uh, by the power of Christ and through the Holy Spirit. All right. Well, thank you. That's our Q&A. I think Pastor Billy...